Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator, and you may have heard the rumours that I've got a massive one. I've got a new sword in my arsenal. It's a big two-handed sword, and we're going to get to that in due course. But I posted a picture of this sword. Uh, it's from Caviton. Incidentally, the link's below uh, to their website. And um, uh, a number of people said, you know, how big is this sword? Obviously, they don't know how big I am. Uh, so uh, in relative terms, it's difficult for them to judge how big the sword is. Clearly, it looks big next to me, but how big am I? Well, I'm 1 meter 84, so I'm I'm just under six foot one um, and we're going to look at the sword in due course but I thought this is also an opportunity to look at some uh, historically significant or popular types of sword compared uh, in size to me so I'm a just over six foot uh, individual uh, as you can see I can move fa fairly far away from the camera so you can get a general idea of the size of these swords in relation to me as a human clearly um, Weapons are to some extent sized to the people who use them. Um, so if you were much bigger than me, then you'd presumably have a longer blade. If you were much smaller than me, you'd have a smaller blade and so on and so forth. But what is interesting is we do get um, uh, different tendencies of sizes of weapons across history. So measuring them against me, we're going to look at some popular types of sword here. Not that many, don't worry. This is a fairly brief video uh, looking at the size of them compared to me. So first up, we're going to start pretty much at the beginning of the historical period of swords and this is a Bronze Age period sword. It's of a British style of sword known as the Ewart Park uh, type of uh, leaf bladed bronze sword and this is a bronze one made by Neil Burridge incidentally. This is an unfinished one, it doesn't have the full help fittings on it um, which I really need to get around to doing or pay someone else to do at some point but um, this will give you a clue as to the size of this weapon relative to me. So relative to one of my arms for example the blade is about the length of my elbow to the tip of my uh, finger. So that's about the length of this blade. And yes, it's a comparable size to something like a Mainz Gladius. It's quite, if we go into the ancient world, a lot of swords of this kind of size. Yes, there were longer ones, um, Spartha and various types of uh, Celtic Latene, for example, longer bladed uh, Iron, um, Iron Age swords. And there were in fact longer bladed Bronze Age ones as well that some people surmise were maybe used by horsemen rather than uh, on foot. Clearly these were used with shields but we won't get into that in this video. So there's an idea of how big this type of sword is, Bronze Age leaf bladed sword from uh, Britain but also found all the way across Europe and quite similar as well to certain types of um, Bronze Age Greek uh, swords and early Iron Age swords and even if we go through, through to things like the Xiphos as well uh, used by hoplites. So there we go that's the size of this sword, not particularly big, kind of machete size. Okay now we're going to move um, forward in time into the so-called Dark Ages with a Viking era sword. Uh, this is approximately a 30 inch blade, they vary usually between about usually about 27 and 30 inches. Uh, so this is a relatively long example but there you get an idea, if I step back and put the tip on the ground, you'll see that um, it's a typical kind of length of what a lot of uh, kind of post Iron Age swords have been since the Roman Spartha onwards really. So it's a fairly typical length also for various types of knightly sword used in the uh, later Middle Ages, also fairly typical of military swords, sabres, things like this, uh, capped balgers, um, uh, even uh, the langmesser, we'll look at that in a second. So there we go, it's a, a typical kind of length for a one-handed sword, can be used with or without a shield um, as a backup weapon. And this is a very convenient length to wear, of course, and part of the length of these weapons, debatably, we'll talk about that as we get to a later period sword, is dictated by what's easy to carry and wear and practical and so on and so forth. So uh, there's an idea really comparable to my uh, body. It's about from my shoulder to the tip of my finger this time. Okay, so that gives you an idea, perhaps uh, if you want to length a, a, a measure a blade um, size to you, for the Dark Ages then maybe something like shoulder to tip of finger uh, might be a good idea to go for. It'll give you a rough idea and if you're an artist or something like that, if you're drawing then you know that might give you an idea for proportions as well. Right, moving forward in time into the later medieval period, into the 15th century, we come to the Langmesser, the German Langmesser, very similar to other forms of falchion, 
uh, and other types of one-handed sword and in fact arming swords of this time so the double-edged swords can come in a variety of lengths you get long ones and short ones so I've avoided arming swords here but the Langmesser again these vary in size, they, they can be much shorter than this um, and they can be longer than this and you do in fact get two-handed versions. There are in fact big longsword sized ones uh, or kind of Zweihander sized ones uh, but this is a relatively typical um, size Langmesser of the 15th century and what's interesting to note is that it's approximately the same size as a Viking era sword. It's a little bit shorter and some people think of these as short swords because they're comparing it to a long sword which bear in mind is predominantly a two-handed sword this is predominantly a one-handed sword yes you could grip it with two hands but predominantly a sword intended to be used uh, in in one hand um, and the extra length of grip there is there for balance and hooking and various other purposes but it's basically a one-handed sword so again in terms of length we're looking at something like from my shoulder to the tip of my finger uh, if we're talking about length if we put it on the ground again it comes up to kind of my groin uh, height so you can see it's relatively small right we're just for one sword one special sword we're going to shift continent to a whole different continent uh, and I couldn't resist sticking a uh, katana in here uh, partially because I want, to, I want to compare it to two other swords which are coming after this um, and in terms of the length of this now it's funny again this is a fairly typical this is about a 28 inch blade uh, which is fine that's fairly typical for the 16th century for example Muromachi period in Japan and again it's something like from the shoulder to the tip of the finger so it's similar to the one-handed European swords but we've got the long grip Debatably, for some similar-ish reasons to the uh, Langmesser, German Langmesser, you don't have to use, whilst we're conventionally used to seeing this used in two hands, it can absolutely be used in one hand, and people like Mizashi used it in one hand. Most people on horseback most of the time would have used it in one hand, and anybody using a Wakasashi in the left hand would have been using it in one hand. So you can use these swords in one hand. They're not particularly nimble in one hand, but you can do it and you actually have longer reach with one hand than you do with two. Um, so there's some advantages to using these in one hand, but they are a little bit more cumbersome and they are predominantly, I think, supposed to be designed originally, certainly from the uh, Tachi, as a two-handed sword. Um, but anyway, we'll come back to the length of this. If we just gingerly touch the tip uh, to the ground, uh, you'll see again it comes up to my kind of crotch height there. Um, so it's, a, it's actually a relatively, for a two-handed weapon, if we're using it two-handed of course, it's a relatively short weapon and I've talked about that in lots of videos. Not to say that Japanese swords always were and Tachi were sometimes longer than this um, and things like the Odachi and the Nodachi were generally um, bigger than this. Right, now we're going to move on to a contemporary sword but back in Europe and that is the rapier. Now you'll notice if I just again gingerly touch my tip to the ground you'll notice that this is now noticeably longer and this isn't a particularly long rapier now this is modeled on the proportions of one in the Wallace collection and this is a 17th century rapier um, that type of katana for example could date to anywhere between the 16th and the 19th century um, or indeed 20th um, but if I put the tip on the ground there you can see that it comes up to more like my navel now some of these rapiers at their longest actually come un under the armpit or even up to the shoulder joint so rapiers can be super long and they vary and some of them are shorter than this uh, that's worth mentioning as well rapiers aren't always super long sometimes they're more typical lengths for what we see of backswords and broadswords of the same period um, but this is a sort of middle of the road uh, length I would say I think it's about a 43 inch blade so it's longish but it's not particularly long um, and that's the sort of height that it comes up to now measuring to my proportions you'll notice now instead of going from my shoulder to tip of finger this kind of blade almost goes from the far shoulder to the tip of my finger so that gives you an idea of the proportions involved here obviously that means in wearing these were one worn much lower down slung much lower down so that you could still draw the sword without too much trouble and get it out um, but nevertheless they do get in the way and we know that in England for example uh, Queen Elizabeth had issues about the length of uh, blades being worn at court um, so the longer blade you wear the more inconvenient it is to you and other people around you just a reminder of that um, but there we go the rapier is by one-handed 
sword standards one of the longer swords from all of history from anywhere in the world not the necessarily the longest uh, but I think certain forms of rapier have probably been pretty much just about the longest one-handed swords that we have seen historically. And as I say, this is a sort of medium length one. Some rapiers will come up to about there. So again, if you're drawing or trying to proportion a rapier compared to a person, expect it to be longer and look longer in proportion to their body than something like a Viking era sword or a Langmesa or a Katana, indeed. Now, finally. <laughs> <laughs> so what you've been waiting for, so we finally come to the two-handed sword. Um, these go by various names. Commonly in modern pop culture they're known as Zweihander due to a few computer games primarily. Historically they probably weren't really called Zweihander, they were called parrot by things like um, uh, Schlachtswert and um, perhaps Bidenhander in some cases. In England they were just called two-handed swords, two-hand sword. Um, in Italy, they were called Spadone. In Spain, they were called Montante. So they can go by various names, but essentially it's a big two-handed sword. It's not a hand and a half sword. It's not a bastard sword. It's indisputably a two-handed sword. <laughs> now, what's funny is I was about to say, you have to use it with two hands. Ironically, there are things you can do with these swords with one hand. And if we look at certain um, treatises, fencing manuals from the time, we do see occasionally they're used in one hand. But that's another topic uh, for a whole different video. Uh, but I have covered it in past videos. So here we go. So this is a two-handed sword. I'll call it a spadone because I study mostly Italian treatises. It's a spadone made by Cavitan Armory. And it's a super nice thing. Now a full review of this will follow in due course, but putting my tip gingerly on the ground, in fact it doesn't matter here because it's grass, you will see that this sword is almost as tall as me. Now bear in mind I'm, uh, I'm 1 meter 84, 184 centimeters, uh, so just under 6 foot 1. So this is about 5 foot 11. Uh, ish, maybe six foot, uh, no, probably 5'11 in uh, imperial measurements. I don't know what that is in centimetres, but you can work it out. It's a pretty long thing. Now, my other two-hander, you'll know, comes up to about my chin. Um, so this is a noticeable extra bit of length. It's longer in the blade. Uh, I don't think it's longer in the handle. It's just longer in the blade, and it has a more slender blade than the other one. So it is uh, marginally lighter, um, but you're getting a bit of extra length as well as it being slightly lighter. So it's, a, it's quite a good um, bit of extra amount of reach without adding extra weight, okay? This is an impressively massive sword. And I won't even say this is as big as they got. There are, in the Wallace collection, there is one that's about that long. Uh, it's taller than me. Now, some people would argue that those are parade swords, that they're not necessarily meant for use. I don't know, it's difficult to tell if you look at the uh, the, uh, the way that they're built, those ones, they're built exactly the same as the ones which are sharp and we know were used. I won't go into what they were used for, how they were used and all that kind of stuff, I'll save that for future videos, but again, I have talked about it a bit in the past. Um, so this is a big sword. Now, compare it to the others. So first of all, the cross guard comes up to the bottom of my sternum and the pommel comes up to my brow ridge on this one, okay? You can see that if I hold this out sideways, that is a huge amount of reach. And it's not difficult, it's very well balanced, uh, so it's not difficult to hold it out. In fact, it's not that difficult to hold it out by the pommel either. And uh, as I mentioned, there are certain attacks and certain treatises where you actually extend the thing out, usually with thrusts, with one hand from the pommel end to get an enormous amount of reach, spear-like reach, really. Um, and at least one treatise of the time pretty much recommends if you're fighting one-on-one -on -one against someone to use it more like a spear. If you're fighting multiple opponents, then to use it more like a giant longsword or moving around the whole time with cuts. Um, so very different ways of using it in different scenarios or contexts. So just to compare this to some of the other weapons, so this is a 16th century style sword, so even 17th as well. So let's compare it to the rapier. Now what might surprise you is whilst the two-hand sword looks far more massive than the rapier, in fact their blade reach is not that different. Now remember that the rapier came from the tip of this finger to almost, not quite really, my rear shoulder. Okay, now if I take the two-handed sword uh, and put the tip there, you'll see it comes 
The base of the blade, so the tip's level with the tip of my finger, the base of the blade comes about halfway down this arm. So it is quite a bit of extra reach, but if I put them blade against blade, you'll see it is more, it is a lot more, but it's not, it's not like horrendously massively more, especially when you consider what they look like next to each other. And a lot of this, of course, is because we've got a lot of extra grip or hilt here. Whereas this is one hand sword with a short hilt. So one of the big differences between these two things is actually the enormous grip on the two-hander. While the two-hander does have more blade in this particular scenario, it's not maybe as much more as you might think or perceive simply by seeing this sword in front of me and then seeing that sword in front of me. When you actually put them side by side, the blade difference is not hugely different. But uh, that being said, the rapier already has a long blade and this has a reach advantage against most, most other sword types it would come against, for example, basket hilted broadsword or a, a falchion or a hanger. Okay, so this has a lot of uh, reach advantage, but this has even more reach advantage. So this has an advantage over the rapier and of course it has an advantage over all the other swords it might come against. Yeah, you can't wear it, you can't take it, you can't carry it around most places, it's very cumbersome, it's more of a pole arm than a sword, blah blah blah, we know all of those things. But sword versus sword, this has by far the leverage and reach advantage. And you don't have to move it in big movements, you can move it in fairly tight movements in front of you. Um, so it's surprisingly nimble for its weight and size. But what I do want to show you, just because I think it's funny, <laughs> <laughs> is the difference between a European Spadone, or Zweihander if you want to call it that, and a typical size Katana. <laughs> and um, I find it quite hilarious in how differently they're sized. And I am aware, of course, that in some like video games or even role-playing games or whatever, you might, some people might have you know, a scenario where someone with a Spadone comes up against someone with a Katana. And honestly, <laughs> they're completely incomparable in terms of size. Uh, this is the size of a, you know, it's got the blade length of a relatively short one-handed European sword against something that's incomparably huge. Um, so these th two things against each other, I think they look rather hilarious uh, in comparison. Anyway, I hope that's um, helped answer some questions about how big this is and how it compares to other swords. And I hope also that this video might have been useful, perhaps just in getting into your brain what these different things look like next to each other, um, but also what they look like in comparison to someone's body proportions, uh, if you're doing any kind of artistic design or anything like that. So, thanks for watching. Uh, give us a like and a subscribe, and I'll see you really soon again for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.